Right now on To The Point, the Sacramento DA threatens to charge city leaders over homeless encampments. The mayor fires back. Some of us are actually working day and night to try to make the problem better. You are going about this all wrong. The Supreme Court rules on ghost guns, the issue exploding in our communities. And Sacramento's main jail expansion back up for debate. Thanks for joining us on To The Point. I'm Alex Bell. Heated moments today at City Hall. The mayor fired back at the Sacramento District Attorney after the DA threatened to prosecute city leaders. And it's the latest in the ongoing saga of clearing homeless encampments. Our Becca Hobbegger has been following this conflict. And I want to be clear, the mayor and the district attorney, I mean, they're trying to solve the homeless crisis, but they are not on the same page. Not on the same page at all. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Mayor Steinberg proposed the city and DA's office work together. But in a new letter sent to the city, the DA basically said, not only is this the city's problem to fix, but hey, city of Sac, if you don't fix it within 30 days, I'll see you in court. I intend to go out swinging. Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg has 17 months left in his final term. In a news conference Tuesday morning, he responded to what he calls a legal threat by Sacramento County District Attorney Tian Ho. Today, the district attorney put out his second letter in the last six weeks, threatening to prosecute city officials, and this time demanding that the city attorney hire more attorneys to prosecute violators of the law living in homeless encampments. The first time I ignored his threat, this time I will not. Mr. District Attorney, prosecuting violators respectfully, that is your job. The city does not prosecute crimes. In June, Sacramento County's presiding judge and the district attorney both sent letters to city officials detailing nuisances related to homeless encampments surrounding the courthouse and demanding the city enforce existing ordinances that ban camping on public property, blocking sidewalks and more. On July 26th, Mayor Steinberg met with D.A. Ho to propose a partnership between the D.A.'s office, the city, the county, and the county court. Steinberg said, here are 10 actions we can all agree and work on together, some of which required action and enforcement on the part of the D.A.'s office, like prosecuting misdemeanors for people unlawfully camping and violating other city ordinances. This week, the D.A.'s office wrote a six-page letter putting that responsibility back on the city and saying if the city doesn't complete Ho's requested actions within 30 days, he could charge city leaders with misdemeanors for each day the public nuisance persists. Mr. Ho, I understand your frustration. We are all frustrated. But some of us are actually working day and night to try to make the problem better. You are going about this all wrong. In a written response, the DA told ABC 10, this local crisis has been made worse by local decisions and indecisions. Therefore, we have taken the first formal step towards litigation against the city of Sacramento. However, we are providing the city an opportunity to adequately address this public safety crisis. Now, some of what the DA is proposing are actions already set in motion by the city, prompting Steinberg to say, Ho is taking credit for city programs. And meanwhile, Alex, last month the DA created a survey for people living in the city of Sacramento to share their experiences with homeless encampments. Ho says his office has received more than 1,600 responses. Yeah, in fact, the DA calls them disturbing and appalling. And tonight we do want to share some of those examples, right, Becca? Yeah, I mean, some people report being assaulted at gunpoint by an unhoused person. A girl's soccer game was postponed because of hypodermic needles on the field. A homeowner reports they were diagnosed with PTSD due to harassment and break-ins by people living in a camp across the street. Others report children having to walk through human feces and urine to get to school. Now, in terms of specific solutions for a list of what the DA and mayor have separately proposed, uh, check out the story on ABC10.com. Thank you so much, Becca. All right, in new tonight, the city of Sacramento acknowledges that it violated a federal order when it comes to clearing homeless encampments at City Hall this month. And now the Sacramento Homeless Union is planning new legal action against the city. So our Luke Cleary is live at City Hall. Luke, what is the city's response to this violation? Well, first, let me tell you where I'm standing here, Alex. I'm underneath the overhang in front of City Hall, which provides a nice measure of shade from the hot sun. But as you take a wider view here, not a single tent underneath this overhang. And that's despite the fact that people have every right to be here, according to homeless advocates. As a result 
of that judge's court order stopping the city from doing any kind of homeless sweeps during this hot weather, this heat wave. Homeless advocates worry that if people are moved away from shady spots like this one into areas that are more exposed in the sun, that people could be at higher health risk related to the heat. Now, we do have a response from the city tonight that acknowledges that they did, in fact, uh, uh, that they did in fact violate this court order. This is from spokesperson Tim Swanson with the city who said in part that the city's been working diligently to follow all aspects of the federal court order, but that it quote, was not as effective in communicating with one of its contractors and its employees leading to the unintentional oversights that occurred on Monday and Friday, Swanson says. The situation involving City Hall has been addressed and remedied. Now, the Sacramento uh, Homeless Union attorney, who I spoke with just a few moments before joining you here on air, would beg to differ that this has been remedied. He said that as a result of those violations, he's going to be pursuing further legal action to hold the city in contempt. The city uh, needs to understand that we're taking it seriously and members of our union and members of the homeless community were put at risk by being put out from an area where there was shade into the into a direct, into more of an exposed uh, situation, which was the whole point of the restraining order in the first place. So this is a fraught issue. We have uh, more with our interview tonight at 11 on Late News Tonight. We're going to be speaking further with the attorney representing the Sacramento Homeless Union. So I hope you join us tonight at 11. But for now, back to you, Alex. Our Luke Cleary reporting tonight. Thank you so much, Luke. And other stories we're following. A man who drove buses for special education students is under arrest, facing charges like rape and sodomy. Tariq Manasra was taken into custody on Friday, months after someone called to report that he had sexually assaulted a dependent adult. He has been employed as a special education bus driver with the Office of Education since October 2021 and faces 10 felony counts. One parent says that he is hurt and angry hurt as a parent and angry. If I think about it as a parent, I get emotional right away. I mean, I see these kids on the buses. The Office of Education tells ABC 10 they conducted background checks through the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and this driver passed. New video tonight shows the getaway U-Haul in a theft at a Yamaha shop. The search continues for seven people caught on camera stealing motorbikes. This happened early Sunday morning at Capital Yamaha on Auburn Boulevard in Sacramento. The shop tells us that they are offering a $2,500 reward to anyone with information on who these people are. This just in, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors approved additional funds for an intake and health services facility at the main jail because back in April of 2020, the board approved a contract with the total maximum amount of $7,025,000. Today, they approved increasing the maximum award to $7,032,000. Opponents believe there are other efforts the county needs to focus on instead of expansion. They wanted the county to delay today's vote until they got a full picture of what is needed and what is not. This project is really fiscally irresponsible. It would lock the county into spending over billion, a billion dollars on jail expansion and lock them into actually diverting resources away from things that our community needs like roads, health and housing. The vote comes after a lawsuit settlement known as the Mays Consent Decree, which called for county officials to improve jail conditions back in 2020. Coming up later on to the point, the Supreme Court weighing in on ghost guns, the problem exploding in Sacramento. We saw a big drop in temperatures for today, down about 15 to almost 20 degrees, how long this sticks around and when the heat returns. And the Mega Millions jackpot at the largest that it's ever been, but how realistic is it to win? Welcome back. I hope you got outside today. It was gorgeous. We finally saw temperatures well below 100 degrees. This was the scene in old Sacramento just a couple hours ago. Ooh. Monica, please tell me that this beautiful weather is going to continue. I know. You, whenever you see those flags blowing and people just kind of enjoying the outdoors, you know, it's summer in Sacramento when we have that beautiful breeze. 
moving our way. You can see the drop in temperatures here. Average high, 92 degrees. For the past couple of days, we've been close to 100. Today, dropping 15 degrees to 85. And we're going to stay right about this range for the next couple of days. 75 for the coast in San Francisco as we head inland right along that I-80 line. Great access to that cooling breeze. A little farther from that, we were still in the 90s, close to 90 for the foothills and close to 80 for the Sierra. Winds right now, 15 to 25 miles per hour. We're going to hang on to those as we head through tonight, dropping into the 50s by the time we get to those overnight lows into early tomorrow morning with that sunrise at 614. Fire risk does go up. We have actually a risk of some abundant lightning coming our way by Sunday into Monday, plus the dry fuels after successive waves of 100s for the past uh, month or so. And that's going to be particularly dangerous below about 4,000 to 5,000 feet. So in the foothills through about the lower Sierra. 80s are here to stay through the week, but here comes that weather feature rolling its way inland initially. A chance of showers and thunderstorms for the central and southern Sierra, but it does expand its way northward to the Tahoe Basin over the weekend. Tomorrow, we're still dry. Highs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s through the foothills. Along the coast, we're in the 60s, some patchy low clouds, and even some drizzle there for the past couple of days. Near 80 to 85, though, by the time we get to the coastal valley areas, deeper into the valley, we'll hit highs in the 80s to right around 90. So our 10-day forecast will include the five-day outlook for the region with a chance of thunderstorms Saturday and Sunday. But you see how we're starting to warm things up by the end of the weekend into early next week. We're back in those 100s. All right. Thank you, Monica. Next on To The Point, the Supreme Court weighing in on ghost guns, the problem exploding in Sacramento. All right, you got about one hour left to go get a ticket. Tonight's Mega Millions jackpot is an estimated $1.58 billion. This would be the third highest in lottery history. Even with the cash option, it's still a huge payout of more than $750 million. That's before taxes, of course. But first, you're going to need to beat the 1 to 302 million odds. There have been 31 drawings without a winner since April of this year. If you want a chance it, you do have about till 7.45 or so to make sure that you buy your ticket. New Supreme Court ruling today will now allow the Biden administration to enforce rules to cracking down on so-called ghost guns. Today's vote was five to four. Ghost guns are untraceable, homemade, improvised firearms. They lack commercial serial numbers and owners are usually not subject to federal or state commercial background check regulations. Today's ruling clarifies that ghost guns fit within the definition of firearm under federal law, but this case remains pending before a federal appeals court. Now, ghost guns can be built with kits available online and even be 3D printed. As we reported, the problem of ghost guns has exploded in Sacramento. Ghost guns are untraceable, unregistered, and illegal. Just last year, Sacramento police told us this is an issue that they've been tracking for at least five years. The recent increase in ghost guns is due to the easy accessibility online. They'll come 80% uh, finished, and it really doesn't take much to actually finish uh, a certain portion of the gun to actually make it a gun and for the pieces to be put together uh, very quickly. The street name for these guns is an 80 percenter. Once someone receives their nearly complete gun, they can go online and instructions are readily available to finish the piece. The guns end up in the hands of children. Seeing kids, sometimes younger than 15 years old, uh, carrying ghost guns in our community. And it's very, very alarming to us that these guns are, they're not traceable. They don't have serial numbers on them. We don't know that they exist. People without training and violent offenders who aren't allowed to have weapons get these guns. Sergeant Eaton says, simply put, more guns in the community means more gun violence. Sacramento police say they took 400 ghost guns off the streets in 2021. They have a detective with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives Task Force in Sacramento specifically dealing with ghost guns. And they say that they have assigned additional detectives to the task force to help get all these illegal guns off the streets. Southwest Airlines is now facing new legal problems. A white mother says that she was accused of trafficking her biracial daughter. She filed a federal lawsuit against Southwest Airlines, alleging that she and her daughter were victims of blatant racism by airline employees. Mary McCarthy and her 10-year-old daughter flew from Los Angeles to Colorado in 2021 to attend a family member's funeral. 
On their connecting flight, McCarthy says that she asked multiple passengers to switch seats with her daughter so that they could sit together. But a flight attendant apparently found something that she did and the interactions between the two suspicious. When they landed in Denver, video taken by McCarthy shows officers and a Southwest representative waiting for them. Because of the way Southwest has their seating, we were the, we were the, it's okay, sweetheart. We were, we were the last ones on because we were the last ones to buy the flight. According to the police report, a Southwest flight attendant called authorities to report possible human trafficking. McCarthy and her daughter were allowed to go after showing identification. Southwest said that it is reviewing the incident and plans to reach out to McCarthy to address her concerns. Meanwhile, tonight, two people are okay thanks to Sacramento County's Human Trafficking Task Force and the FBI's help. The joint effort to the joint effort led to the arrest of five sex trafficking exploiters as part of a nationwide law enforcement operation. Several dozen adult victims were also found as well. And it is back to school week for some school districts right here in our area. Today, Folsom Cordova Unified's first day back. 21,000 students return to school today. And our area's largest school district, Elk Grove Unified, heads back to school on Thursday. Some students are already back, but everyone is expected to go back on Thursday. So please let this go ahead and be your warning now. If you live near a school, the traffic could soon impact your commute. And summer vacations have not always been something that school districts have had. So tonight we take a look at how school summer break really got its start. So why do kids get a summer vacation? You probably think you know the answer. Farmers, right? Nope. That's the story a lot of us heard growing up. Kids got the summer months off so they could help around the farm. But if you think about it, that doesn't really make sense. You don't plant or harvest during that time. So what's the real story? There is a kernel of truth to the helping out on the farm thing. According to historians before the Civil War, kids in rural areas took off during the fall and spring, when farming actually happened, and went to school in the summer and winter. In cities, schools were open year round and children just went when they could. Before the advent of air conditioning, those cities were sweltering during the summer and wealthy residents weren't going to sweat in silence. So they took off for cooler climates, dragging their children with them. Eventually, middle class families followed suit and city schools were forced to close during the hottest months. By the late 19th century, reformers were pushing for a standardized school calendar and urban districts decided to make summer vacation official. Rural schools soon followed suit. Now kids across the country enjoy a few months off. No farm work required. And students are going back to school five days a week, but there's a trend that's growing across the country right now to change the five day week to four. And the theory is to make this easier to hire teachers and it offers greater flexibility for families and teachers. According to the publication EdSource, officials have allowed some school districts in remote areas of California to move to the four days a week. But it is complicated because California's education code requires schools to hold classes five days a week or they have their funding reduced. Still ahead, your points, a video going viral of a beating at a Stockton convenience store. Welcome back. We read your messages, your comments, and your points about the stories that we report on. Last week, we brought you this. This video has been viewed millions of times. A man tried to steal tobacco products from the 7-Eleven on Center Street in downtown Stockton. An employee grabs the man and takes him to the ground, while another employee grabs a wooden pole and starts hitting the man. The person who recorded the video eventually steps in and walks the man out of the business. He says the two workers who protected their store did a courageous act. I believe that if I wasn't there, that that guy would probably uh, be more hurt than what he was. And I believe that the community needs to take care of each other. And we need to make sure that we are morally doing the right things in life. This all happened right across the street from the Stockton Police Department headquarters. Officers say they are investigating the attempted robbery. 7-Eleven did not respond to a request for comment. Now, many of you have been weighing in on this. Some saying, great job, employees. He simulated he had a gun. Another person writing saying, I think they reacted accordingly. He wasn't just taking a candy bar or one pack of cigarettes. He knew what he was doing. If more people reacted like this, there would be less of this going around. 
As always, if you have something that you want to add to the stories that you've seen right here on To The Point, let us know. You can always text us at 916-321-3310 or very easy, you can email me and the team at to the point at abc10.com. Have a great night. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.